A taxi in question in Israel for the holiest church in Christianity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, has closed its doors. Is a tax dispute the reason for the almost unprecedented protest, or is it because the Christian presence in the holy city is threatened? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Hashim Ahalbara. Welcome to the program. Churches in Israel have long been exempt from paying taxes, but a proposed law may soon scrap centuries of precedent. The Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem faces paying tens of millions of dollars in back taxes. It's one of the world's holiest, most visited religious places, considered by many Christians to be where Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and then resurrected. The church closed its doors indefinitely on Sunday in protest. And what religious leaders describe as an attempt to weaken Christians in Jerusalem? Harry Fawcett has more. So for a third day now, the door to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre remains shut. People many of them from around the world who've come to visit this site, to pray at this site, well, the best they can do is pray at the door or take pictures at the door, because this is a pretty historic event. It's a very rare move for the three patriarchates, the three churches which jointly run this holy site. Uh, they've taken in opposition to two things. Firstly, the move by Jerusalem's municipality to claim what it says are $186 million worth of back taxes owed by, in particular, the Greek Orthodox Church on its commercial properties, which it owns in and around Jerusalem. The mayor of Jerusalem is saying that uh, they owe taxes like everybody else. If they have a problem, they should turn to the courts. The churches themselves are saying that this is discriminatory, abusive against Christians in the Holy Land. They're also protesting against a proposed piece of legislation which would allow the Israeli government to seize land which the church had sold to private investors in the past. They say, the, the, the proponents of that law say that it is a way of trying to protect the rights of people who have apartments and houses on that land whose futures are thrown into some confusion by this. Again, the church is saying that this is a way of discriminating against them. It would devalue the land that they own in and around Jerusalem more generally. So for now, this standoff continues and this hugely important holy site remains closed. The church was built in the fourth century in the Christian quarter of Jerusalem's old city. It attracts thousands of pilgrims because it's believed to contain the two holiest sites in Christianity, where Jesus Christ was crucified, buried and resurrected. A 19th century shrine surrounds the tomb with an onion-shaped dome. Greek Orthodox, Armenian and Roman Catholics share custody of the church. The so-called status quo that defines ownership of the holy sites was agreed hundreds of years ago by the Ottomans. The church's gatekeeper for the last 800 years is a member of a Muslim family. It is not the first time the Sipaka has closed its doors for political reasons. Its large wooden doors were shut for a day 28 years ago in protest at Jewish settlers nearby. Let's go to our guests. Joining us in Jerusalem, Farid Jibran, legal advisor to the Roman Catholic Church's custodian of holy sites. In Den Bosch, in the Netherlands, Frank Bosman, associate professor at Tilburg School of Theology. Also in Jerusalem, by Skype, Alan Baker, Director of the Institute for Contemporary Affairs at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Welcome to you all, all of you to the program. Let me start by asking Mr. Farid Jabran this. Closing the holiest church for Christians, is it a symbolic gesture or are we going to see more steps in the near future? Well, it was a forced gesture. Uh, the heads of churches uh, being uh, under uh, uh, the pressure of the recent uh, uh, activities of the civil authorities uh, uh, by way of the advancement of the legislation concerning the church lands uh, in Jerusalem or by uh, a way of the actions of the municipality of Jerusalem, the heads of churches uh, found, found themselves uh, in front of a new reality where the mission of the church uh, in the Holy Land is being hindered, is being threatened. Uh, and so they had to send a symbolic message, a message of protest uh, mm -hmm. uh, to those who would like to hear. Uh, so that was the background for the decision. Mr. Baker, the reaction from the church leaders in 
uh, Jerusalem. Do you see it as a genuine outcry against what they describe to be an attempt by the Israelis to undermine the presence of the Christians in Jerusalem, or do you see it more of a politically motivated move? Well, no, I, I, it, it's not an outcry uh, against uh, any any attempt by Israel to to uh, prejudice the, the status of the Christians in, in Jerusalem or in Israel. This is a, a dispute uh, on taxation and, and property and nothing more and nothing less. And, and so uh, uh, if it's a problem, then it can be solved by going to court or by litigation and not by a, a political demonstration which harms the, the, uh, uh, the, the freedom of worship by uh, Christians, uh, which is an international, uh, internationally acknowledged freedom. Mr. Bosman, as an associate professor of theology, would like some perspective here before we get into the details. Should churches be taxed or remain tax exempt? Well, I can say from the Euro North European situation that in the majority of countries, it's quite common for the church and the other religious organizations or movements to pay taxes and to be taxed as all other uh, public organizations are. There are a few exemptions, of course, when it comes to the former uh, state churches, like the, the Protestant churches in, in Denmark or in, or in Germany. But taking it on the whole, the religious organizations are, are taxed just like all the other organizations are. Mm -hmm. Sir Gibran, you are the legal advisor to the Roman Catholic Church's custodian of holy sites. We're talking about two different things here. Let's start with the first issue, which is basically the, uh, the municipality uh, working towards imposing a, a collecting property tax called the Arnona on church-owned properties that are not used as houses of worship. One might say or might wonder what's wrong with this because the churches run companies that generate cash and therefore they need to be taxed. Well, the church has never presumed, uh, pretended to have exemption, uh, full exemption from taxes or not to pay taxes or to be treated differently from others. However, according to Israeli law itself, according to legislation valid in this uh, piece of land for centuries, church institutions and uh, religious institutions enjoyed certain exemptions from taxes, mainly due to the fact that these institutions carried out a charitable and social mi a, a mission in the country through hospitals, schools, hospices, houses for the elderly, sometimes substituting for the role of the state itself or for the government itself. I'm not talking about the government of Israel. I'm not talking about any specific government. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, uh, the time being. So the churches have acquired throughout the century certain exemptions. The municipality of uh, Jerusalem is speaking about commercial, uh, commercial activities. The fact is that the announcements or the notifications that got to the churches recently uh, well, uh, the churches learned about them from the press, first of all. We, on the 31st of, uh, of January, we woke up to an, a, a news article, news item, which actually broke the status quo that has been respected for the last uh, 50 or 70 years, uh, saying that we are starting to collect uh, debts. Uh, and now, without defining, without specifying, without explaining the reason for this ch sudden change in, uh, in the policy. So we are not talking about creating a new legal regime in, the, in, the, mm -hmm. in, in Jerusalem, but the on the fact that there is an existing regime respected bo both by the Ottomans, okay. by the British mandate, by the Jordanian rule in the part of Jerusalem, and then by the state of Israel until the 31st of, uh, 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 of January. Mr. Baker, how can we reconcile between uh, what the... Uh, Christian uh, uh, church leaders say is the need to maintain the status quo because the churches play other roles. They, are, they run char charities and therefore if taxes are imposed on them, some of that uh, work could be undermined. And the fact that the municipality is saying we need cash, we need to run the municipality of Jerusalem and therefore the only way to do it because we're not getting money from the government, we're going, we're going to tax churches. Well, look, in the same way that any hotel or any business or any uh, restaurant or cafe uh, has to pay uh, uh, taxes everywhere in the world, uh, the same with respect to the churches. They, they own property that they use as hotels. They charge uh, for, for staying in these hotels. They, they run businesses that, that uh, earn profits that uh, uh, should be taxed. 
Now, I've got no argument with Mr. Gibran about the fact that for the last 50, 70 years, uh, there's been established a sort of status quo in which uh, the Israeli authorities refrain from uh, uh, demanding this tax, despite the fact that it's perfectly legitimate. And here he has a, a serious case, because uh, uh, the, the, the fact is that, that these taxes weren't exacted. So um, I, I think it, he, he has a serious case, and if he chooses to take this to an Israeli court and to question uh, the uh, uh, new policy of the uh, municipality of Jerusalem, I, I think this is what he should do and mm -hmm. have it dealt with by judges. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bosman, I mean, this has always been a sensitive issue, uh, imposing taxes on uh, religious establishments. But in a place like Jerusalem, the, uh, where you have three monotheistic religions uh, uh, trying to co coexist against the backdrop of very difficult uh, political lands landscape. Do you think that this decision by the Israeli uh, by the municipality of Jerusalem is a right decision, or do you think that it could create further problems in the future? Well, I think just as you say that the situation in Jerusalem is uh, very, very difficult, exactly because the three monotheistic religions try to coexist with one another, and all the problems we have in recent or more or more uh, historical uh, times. I think. Everything should be done to uh, maintain the the peace and the coexistence between the religious groups. And if there is a, if uh, taxes should be uh, should be, uh, if the churches are obliged to have taxes in the near future, then it should be arranged in uh, direct dialogue with the churches uh, and and find out perhaps some different uh, commodities in which such a thing could be could be worked out. For example, in the North European countries, the churches are uh, taxed by the government. But if the the population, if people give money to the church or other religious organisations, they can they can uh, they can uh, uh, subtract it from their from their own taxes they have to pay. Mm -hmm. So the gifts are exempt from taxes. Maybe such things could be arranged in Jerusalem as well. So that on one hand you can have the incomes the city of Jerusalem uh, uh, should have, and the other side uh, make sure that the difficult and delicate position of the mm -hmm. churches and the religious institutions in Jerusalem can be maintained. Mr. Gibran, the controversy is about two legislations. The Arnona on the uh, uh, properties that have nothing to do with uh, houses of worship and also the new legislation which has been presented by Rachel Azaria about the expropriation of lands sold by churches to investors. And this raises a problem, which is basically the uh, legislators in Israel are saying that we cannot allow this to continue because we need to step in to protect the owners and we need to get more clarity from the landlords about whether they, they are going to re uh, renew the leases, at what cost, and we need to protect people ultimately. This explains why we'd like to expropri expropriate lands. Well, uh, thank you for the question. With your permission, I would like to follow up uh, uh, shortly on the, on the remarks of uh, Professor Baker regarding the, the legal action and, re and regarding uh, the taxation of restaurants and cafes and things like that. Uh, my distinguished professor, uh, Alan Baker, knows very well that uh, throughout the recent years, the State of Israel and the Holy See have been negotiating an agreement regarding the fiscal matters, the financial and the economic matter related to the Catholic Church. I'm here referring to the Catholic Church. To the Catholic Church, including one of the items on the agenda is in, in, the, in the negotiations is the item of the, of the Arnona, of the property tax. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the status quo, in the agreement signed between the Holy See and the State of Israel in 1993, both parties and we, even without the agreement, it's a, a, it's a basic principle of international relations that parties, first of all, should be a, 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 a respect agreements and should nego negotiate in good faith. So while the parties are negotiating on the issue exactly of how we define a commercial, a, a commercial institution, how we tax a, a hospital, how we tax a, mm -hmm. a, a, a house for accepting the pilgrims who come to the day, here comes the Jer Jerusalem municipality, Jer the Jerusalem mayor, and decides that, okay, I'm deviating from, this, uh, from this, uh, uh, these negotiations. I'm not uh, regarding what the government is, uh, is doing, and I'm taking my own action, and I'm starting to collect. 
One important, uh, one imp another important issue is that the notification we, rec we received uh, in the churches were uh, notifications with a uh, retroactive effect. So he's changing the policy not from now on. The municipality is not changing the policy from now on. She's changing, uh, it's, uh, changing the policy for the last seven years. The, the, the debts that are uh, requested from the various churches are for the last seven years. I want you to... Now, referring to the issue... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, yes. Yes. I want you to answer my question referring particularly about, question. Uh, about the expropriation of land that is sold by the churches to yeah. uh, investors. Well, the issue with, the, with, the, with this legislation is its nature and its, uh, its character. Well, in, 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 an Ara in, in Arabic, there is a proverb, there is a say that the, the, the letter is obvious from its title. Mm -hmm. The title of this law is Church Land Bill, Church Land Law. It's a bill. It's still not, a, not yet a law, which means immediately that this law targets a specific uh, group of the population. It targets lands of the church. It targets property of the church even if it's, uh, the wording of the law says that after it's being sold, and it, ta it targets a constitutional protected right by the same constitutional uh, uh, law of my state, of the, of the state of Israel. Now, uh, the, the issue here is not, not what's happening with the lands, is how dare the legislator legislate or pr even propose a bill that carries this name and has this tar uh, this, uh, this, uh, these char uh, characteristics. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, yeah, let's yeah, talk a little bit in detail about this particular issue. And let me go back to Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, the, the expropriation, uh, expropriation bill was said to have been uh, presented the moment it was revealed that the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate sold a land at the center of Jerusalem where 1,500 people live. But they have absolutely no idea about who are the new land lords, are they going to renew the leases for them and at what price? And, th and therefore, there needs to be a new regulation. The question here is, the attention sounds on paper, decent, nice, good for the benefit of people. But can you not do it in a different way? Talk to the religious groups, the churches, think about a new framework, put it together, agree on it and move forward. Well, uh, uh, look, the, the issue is this, that the, this property no longer belongs to the church. The, the church sold it. Uh, uh, and therefore, it's been transferred to the ownership of private companies uh, who are beginning to raise the rents uh, uh, in a very dramatic way. And so this whole legislation is intended to protect those uh, 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 people who are renting uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the property that's been sold by the church. It's no longer church property. It's, the problem is that it still enjoys some type of uh, uh, tax uh, uh, breaks because it was titled as church property. But now that it's no longer church property, the aim of this legislation is merely to, to prevent this type of thing happening uh, in order to protect those who, who, who are at the mercy of uh, companies or land companies uh, that, that intend to raise the rent in a very dramatic way. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bosman, we're talking about an area that has a huge significance for Muslims, Jews, Christians, where holy sites could be used as centers to build reconciliation between people. What we're seeing here is a potential for more instability and more violence. What is the way out? How do you see the best way out from this? Well, I think that uh, the way out is making a very clear distinction between those uh, properties owned by the various churches in the Holy Land and in Jerusalem, which are used for specific religious uh, acts and activities and celebrations at the one hand, and the other side, those uh, properties uh, that are built for a strictly commercial business. And I think all parties should uh, agree with one another that those are two quite different ways uh, how to use a property and I think those two specific different way of using property should be taxed in quite a different way mm. uh, and the end and the ending forward is of course always as we have learned here in northern Europe using what's called the Rhineland model the model of the Rhineland and that's all the partners should negotiate with one another until an agreement is reached in which all parties uh, agree and which all parties do 
some some water in the wine, if that's an expression yeah. also in English. Um, that's the only way forward, and especially in a, such a difficult political situation mm -hmm. as in Jerusalem, every treat should be considered uh, highly before actually doing it. Mr. Mm -hmm. Zabran, do you feel like you, that you're paying the price just because you happen to be caught in the middle of a feud between the mayor of Jerusalem, Mir Bakat, and Finance Minister Moshe Kahlon, because Bakat says, I need cash. Kahlon says, I, can't, I have no cash to give, and therefore they're using this in particular to try to raise more pressure or put more pressure on the government to give them cash. I wouldn't like to go into political interpretations of what's going on uh, in the Jerusalem municipality and its considerations. Why th one thing I can say and I would like to say, the churches do not want to be neither a victim nor a tool in the hands of anybody to campaign uh, uh, for, uh, for his purposes. I cannot delve into the, 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 the issue of uh, the considerations of, uh, of, uh, of Mr. Barkat, neither it's the business of, uh, of the churches. We would like our status to be maintained. We would like to dialogue. We would like to reserve, uh, resolve the problems in an amicable way, not by way of forcing and sending orders and changing policy all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Mr. Baker, uh, one yeah. would say if the Israelis were genuine about the need to solve these issues, they should have maintained a status quo that has prevailed since 1757 when the Ottoman Emperor, Osman III, implemented the Ferman or the decree that paves the way for cohabitation, for the maintaining and also the management of holy sites and lands pertaining to different denominations within the Christian faith. Why would you suddenly decide, you know what, we would like to change that status quo? I'm not sure that in, in the 1700s or 1800s, uh, the church properties were, were used uh, for, to make a, a commercial profit uh, in, in the form of hotels and, and, and restaurants and things like that. So the, the, the situation has changed somewhat. Uh, and, and, and now, uh, in the same way that a hotel which is next, located next to, a, 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 ho next to a, a hotel run by a church, an ordinary hotel has to pay our nona, but the, the church hotel, which, which also makes the same profit and charges very similar uh, rates, uh, is, is exempt from tax. Now, this, you, I agree, this is a situation that's existed for, for many, many years. And uh, personally, I'm not sure the extent to which the, uh, uh, the mayor of Jerusalem has coordinated or uh, informed the Israeli foreign minister or the, the, the <clears throat> finance ministry as to uh, uh, its intention to, uh, uh, to exact the, these taxes. <laughs> uh, as, as to the negotiations with the, with, with the, uh, the Holy See, I, when I was working in the Israeli Foreign Minister, I was part of these negotiations on the, the fiscal agreement. And, and, and I agree with, uh, uh, with Professor Gibran that uh, this, is, this is an open issue. And I'm not, again, I'm not sure the extent to which the uh, municipality has been uh, coordinating with the Israeli Foreign Ministry, which is conducting these negotiations. Okay, Mr. let me go to Mr. Bosman. In less than a minute, please, Mr. Bosman. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that the Christians in, Pal in, in, in Israel were given the opportunity not only to survive, he was referring to the, their fate and the problems they're facing in different parts of the Middle East, but also to thrive. Isn't there a concern here that with this particular incident, that could further damage the reputation of Israel as protector of Christians in the holy sites? Well, it is, of course, that the Christians in the Middle East uh, are facing uh, a terrible fate and are nearly extinct in a couple of uh, Middle Eastern countries. And uh, Israel uh, and the Christian faith always have a very troubling uh, uh, history with one another. But at the same time, we are more or less condemned to one another and to try to, to, to establish a democratic uh, regime, a democratic uh, a policy in the city of Jerusalem. And I think that... Uh, Jews and Christians should treat each other as, uh, as as privileged partners and try to avoid this kind of public uh, public uh, rivalry uh, with one another. We're running out of time. Alan Baker, Farid Jobran, Frank Bosman, thank you very much indeed for your contribution.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Ahlbar and the whole team here. Bye for now.